Hello and welcome to the GX podcast, the world's first podcast focused on government services and their future. In this podcast, we talk about everything related to government excellence, government service design and delivery, GovTech, and citizen engagement. Join us for insightful interviews and conversations every month. Visit us online at gx.ae. Pete and Jane, welcome to the GX podcast. I'm so excited to have both of you on this episode and we've been waiting to speak with you. So let's talk, let's jump directly into what's going on in the world. We are seven or eight months into COVID-19. Governments worldwide have done multiple things to kind of work with COVID-19. Many governments have accelerated the pace of what they've been doing. Many are struggling. Cases are still rising in some countries. And then on the other hand, there's a vaccine out there. And in the next few weeks, maybe one or two or more countries are going to start uh, vaccinating people. So there's Many, many different things happening in the world right this second. The question is, after COVID-19 is under control, and hopefully in the next few months it is, and people have been vaccinated and cases are down and we're doing much better, how will governments react? How will governments bounce back? Who wants to take the first shot at this? I actually think government has already bounced back. I feel like we have seen an unprecedented level of excellence in government in the last seven, eight months, I'm just humbled by what I see in the creativity, caring, and sense of deep connection to purpose in public service. You know, things like chief data officers driving around delivering hotspots so that closed city hall can open as a virtual city hall. I see schools where There are no children coming into the classroom, so they've set up the capability in the parking lot to deliver meals to hungry children. Schools where the janitor doesn't have to clean because there's no one there, so every employee in the school district is on the phone connecting with children. So to me, government has already bounced back. We have government at the center of people's attention. And frankly, if we think about how often we're refreshing our COVID data dashboards, data Mm -hmm. digital government is at the center. So I feel like we've already bounced back. Let's talk about digital transformation. Jane has made some really interesting and great points. How will governments bounce back with digital transformation? Have they already bounced back? Yeah, I agree with Jane on the bounce back. And just to put a finer point on it, I think there are a few particular technologies that have been brought to bear by governments in response to COVID that I think both citizens as well as governments are becoming much more familiar with. Just to pick out three that I know just from different case studies, my focus area is much more at the state and municipal government level. And I think, by the way, there's been an immense civics lesson here brought about by COVID where residents understand that they don't necessarily live in a country or even a state. They live in a county or a city because that's where where many of these decisions are being made. I say this from Los Angeles County, California, and in a patchwork basis, very much in response to local conditions. What we've seen here in the states is that local governments are the ones that are not only the most responsive, they're the ones that are making policy decisions and responding. And so when you get into the technology areas, I'm, again, wanted to pick out three. One is GIS mapping. Jane alluded to this in her earlier comment. Uh, Obviously, we all know the Johns Hopkins national COVID maps. We have worked here at the Gradual Policy School on an LA County map, working with the city of LA as well as the county to provide uh, GIS maps with updated information on service delivery, testing locations, information for the LAUSD school system. That's one. The second is data analytics. Analytics. Carnegie Mellon has a great project they're working on with the city of Pittsburgh and providing information around business development, what businesses in particular are at risk due to certain COVID restrictions, and they're responding accordingly. And then another one is robotics. Their UT Austin, I know, has a very interesting program they're working on there with the city of Austin in delivering meals uh, via robotics. So just to pick out those three areas, and in that, I think both residents are becoming much more familiar with technology and governments are becoming much more facile, if you will, in the use of technology. I don't think that's going away at all. 
Now, given the next three months to the next 24 months, three to 24 months until hopefully we'll, everybody's vaccinated and we're back to something called the next new normal. Now, what are some of the challenges that governments will likely face in these next three to 24 months when it comes to um, delivering services, when it comes to managing expectations of citizens, all the different things that governments do? What do you think is going to happen, Jane? Well, I think we've already seen just brilliant work by data officers, innovation officers, digital officers in government quickly transitioning from in-person service to digital service. And I'm just so impressed with how quickly this has all happened. But I'm also deeply concerned that government needs to serve all of the people, not just those who are fortunate as I am, you know, we're connecting here, not in person as we have done in the past, but we're using technology. But I'll tell you what, the digital divide is getting worse. There are, you know, Pew did a survey and they found that there are 28% of people with a high speed internet connection at home are worried about being able to pay the bill. Wow. Um, 30% of smartphone honor, owners are worried about being able to pay their bills. So what do we do about, so first of all, we've got people who have no access, right? One of the largest city school districts, when school shut down and they wanted to be able to be in contact with parents, half of them had no cell phone or email address on record to reach the parent, right? Mm-hmm. And of the low income, Pew's study showed that 43% of low income parents either the kids are going to have to do the homework on a cell phone because they don't have reliable internet service. So I am very worried about the digital divide. Those of privilege have, we sequester ourselves in our homes. I do my work over the computer, but the people who have some of the toughest jobs, you know, collecting the garbage, the things that that government has to keep doing Yep. are putting people at risk. And it is primarily low income and minority people who are in these jobs where they still have to go to work, they're getting exposed, and uh, their kids aren't able to get their education because of lack of digital services. Yep. So, yep. so I feel like we have a huge challenge ahead, which is to close the digital divide and to keep low income and minority individuals from slipping further from prosperity. Yeah. Pete, what are you seeing? You're in an yeah. educational environment and there's so much connectivity happening. Nothing can happen without being connected in one case. What are you seeing as some of the challenges ahead? You know, I want to echo what Jane said about the digital gap that we're seeing and it being exacerbated in government services, particularly education, as Jane says, but also just in the delivery and connectivity to other services. I think that the greatest challenge that we're going to see over the next three to six months is actually go, is part a challenge, but also part an opportunity. And that is really the budget challenge that cities and states are going to face in the coming months. The shoe has yet to drop here in the United States for our cities and states regarding their budget issues. We've had a couple federal relief bills passed that have been meant to support individuals and businesses. The next one that has taken months to pass and has yet to pass has been outlined as a support measure specifically for states and municipal governments. Depending on on whether that passes and to what degree that support is then meted out to cities and states. I'm afraid that we're going to see the prospect of some cities actually going bankrupt wow. in the first quarter of 2021. The financial and economic issues faced by all countries, but particularly the United States in the closure of businesses, in the drop of drops of GDP. When you see this from the government side, these are the drops in tax revenues. Right. Yeah. And so when you have significant drops in tax revenue, the state of California has an almost $100 billion deficit, it is estimating. That's just one state, not to mention all the cities in this state or yeah. around the country. And so, in that, how states and cities navigate these dramatic budget shortfalls, depending on what relief comes from the federal government is going to be the challenge. Where the opportunity here is, is that it actually puts a greater emphasis on the importance of these digital processes 
to deliver services as well as provide information to those who need it from government yeah. sources. Yeah. And so it actually puts a greater emphasis there. But I'm afraid, as I said, we have not yet seen the full scope and scale of the yeah. financial impact yeah. uh, to yeah. governments. Jane, you mentioned an interesting thing about people not being able to pay bills and we're accessing services, but we don't know where they're going. So it's a very interesting thing that you mentioned, and I wasn't aware of that. Uh, one thing that comes to mind, and we talked about analytics, and we talked about, about GIS mapping, analytics, or robotics. One of the things that's pivotal, I think, around everything is data. And many cities and governments have been working with uh, open data, and, and you know that was happening for a while. COVID-19 is getting us to refocus our priorities and look at different things. What is happening with open data? Do you think there's an opportunity for us to work with open data and maybe accelerate some of the things that we have to do in the next couple of years? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think that for a long time, open data was kind of this, you know, government data nerd thing that nobody else really paid attention to or cared about. But I think that COVID, it has been a horrible thing for almost every aspect of society, but it has put a focus on data in government and it has certainly made us pay attention to these, you know, every city and county has a COVID dashboard. In fact, this where I live, Boston, because the city had a multi-year project to do a data warehouse to integrate data across various different sources, the infrastructure was already in place and within a week our chief data officer was able to stand up both internally for the mayor yeah. and externally for the public, a COVID dashboard. So open data is something now that everyone thinks about, but I want to flip it around, which is that in the past, government open data has been about volume. It's been about how much can you produce? And I can even remember sitting around in meetings with city chief data officers and they're comparing, you know, who's, who's published more data sets? Well, you know, <laughs> how many did you publish isn't as relevant as did you publish the ones that, that the public cares about and what's the quality of the underlying data, right? So Boston actually migrated their open data portal and brought in a cross-section of researchers, civic journalists, data types, and members of the public and said, what of our open data really matters to you? Because they didn't want to migrate everything. They wanted to choose quality over quantity. And I think that's something that we need to pay attention to. Is the information relevant? Is it curated? Is it easy to access? Mm -hmm. Is it mm -hmm. something that people can gain insight from? Or are we just dumping stuff out there? You know, yeah. I, I remember talking to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and the former chief data officer told me, he says, we've got 2000 data sets out there and some of them are useless. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I really hope that we'll have, as we focus on the next yeah. round of open data, that we'll think about quality and also the underlying data source quality. Yeah. So even before COVID, one in three death certificates was wrong. Wow. If you think about it, you know, how does a death certificate get written? Well, it differs in every state and every county in terms of, is it the coroner? Is it the medical examiner? Is it a doctor? Who can sign these things? Yeah. But if I'm an emergency room physician and I have all these people dying, I'm going to write the thing as quickly as possible. If the person had a heart attack, but maybe it was caused by COVID. So it's a complicated thing to unpack, but it gets me to this other thing of quality at the source. Yeah. So much of our data we enter it without thinking, how will it be used and does it matter if it's right? Absolutely. I know we have limited time today and I'd love to have you both for hours and hours, but I do respect your time. I want to ask a couple of quick questions as well. I want to ask Pete, not specifically to you, Pete, but it's an open question about the academic world. And if the mm -hmm. academic world has seen any specific recommendations during this time of COVID-19 that you can suggest to governments, to how to do things. Is there anything that the academic world has come up with in these last few months? It has, and I think it's one of the many silver linings from this COVID pandemic crisis has been the deepening of relationships, the town-gown relationships, we would say here in the States, between academic departments that are focused on data science, data analytics, uh, GIS, AI, and their local and state governments. Here at the School of Public Policy, we happen to be part of something called the Public Interest Technology University Network. 
or affectionately PIT UN, yeah. which is a, a network of about 35 academic institutes that are doing something across the country that are doing something in the area of GovTech or civic tech. And the stories that have come out in these last few months of how these academic institutes have supported their local governments through consulting and even development services is really remarkable. I take Jane's point. This is a remarkable time for big data. And many cities, they may not even know that within the academic institutes in their city, they have real experts that don't necessarily work for the government yeah. and may not be well-versed in some of the challenges that their governments are facing, mm -hmm. but nonetheless can be very helpful in the data analytics work, GIS mapping, other things that we've discussed. And we're seeing that happen across the country. Excellent. Jane, did you want to add something on that? Any observations? If not, that's fine too. I guess I'll just add one thing, which is this is a, something that came out of academia, not directly from COVID, but um, Steve Goldsmith, who I work with mm. at the Kennedy School, uh, he and I put together a website called Operational Excellence, and it's a Harvard Innovations website. And it's all about how to get more efficient at operating in government. And I feel like that's something that isn't a direct result of COVID, but gosh, you know, as Pete talked about, just the whole horrible budget problems that are looming for us in state and local government. We need tools. And anyway, so this uh, innovations website is one where we pull together all the government efficiency studies done by the consulting firms and by think tanks and researchers. And so it's meant to be helpful and I hope it will be. Yeah, it actually, I can segue into my next point. And I wanted to talk about behavioral economics and how governments have tried to drive citizen behavior. Have have you seen, Jane or Pete, both of you, have you seen anything happening on that front? Like, are any specific instances where uh, we can look at designing services and uh, service excellence in a different way and behavior? Have you seen anything academically or at a research level? Well, I guess I'll start if we're talking about nudging. You know, I do think that some of the GIS mapping and the integration of some of these maps and social media, yeah. the ability of governments to reach out directly and in new ways to their residents through the auspices of Facebook or Twitter, yeah. Uh, yeah. making them aware of, say, where testing sites are located or service provision opportunities are there. Wouldn't call that necessarily a nudge, but in the same way, brand new avenues of communications between government and citizens. Uh, what about digital expectations in the next two to five years? Can we talk about maybe one or two things that governments should be doing right now to meet or exceed digital expectations in, let's say, the decade ahead? What should governments focus on, Jane? So um, what I would like to see <laughs> is government investing in its people. Most talented chief data officers in government, you know, the average tenure is about 18 months. Why is that? Because they go someplace else where they can make more money, have interesting, stimulating projects to work on, interesting colleagues. I feel like in government, we need to invest in both the digital and data talent pipeline, but also in bringing up the data skills of every single member of our public service teams and, you know, make government an interesting place to work again. Mm. And, you know, I think about the whole generation of people in the U.S. who went into the military after our terrorist attack of September 11th. Mm. It mm. called forth a level of nationalism and pride and mm. a feeling of wanting to serve. And my hope is that we can take the... COVID crisis and that it shines a light on the amazing work of public servants and that inspires more people to come in to public service. And then that we can retain them and improve their skills because that's the direction the world is going, whether it's the uh, fact that I can check myself out at the grocery store using technology or that robots are doing work that used to be done in warehouses. There are so, there's so much automation that's coming into the workforce that we need to take all workers and upskill them. And so I hope government can lead the way. Excellent. Very, very good points. Uh, Peter, what do you think? I love the way Jane put that. 
uh, with the reference to 9-11, I've done a fair amount of speaking to students here and others about this being a 9-11 moment. I was in New York on 9-11 and my own life and career was profoundly impacted by that day and the events that followed. The response here is going to be different. This is not a military response, but it is a public service request or a baton that has been placed, or a gauntlet rather, that has been placed before us to consider anew how we will support our own communities that have been decimated by this. And in that, technology is becoming, as you all know, th this, this trajectory of the use of technology in government has been going for well over a decade. GovTech and civic tech are real fields that have been burgeoning. But what happened here is I would say that the curve went like from this to this, yeah. and the needs for local government leaders and state government leaders to be much more well-versed in the areas that we've discussed, big data, AI, internet of things, GIS mapping and visualizations more broadly. These are the public leadership skills of the 21st century that frankly were not equipped well enough or broadly enough to deliver the kinds of services in a way that our citizens demand and deserve. Absolutely. Jane and Peter, both of you, I really uh, want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for spending uh, this time with us, talking to our audiences on the GX podcast. I have a last question. Let's talk about one radical idea, whatever it is, whatever you wish to be. Let's say we have a genie who can grant us that wish. What would be that one moonshot, one radical idea that you would like to put forward today that can change the way we see and consume government services? What would that one idea be? Vision or quest, much as request, is that we don't have another person graduate from policy school, either at the graduate or increasingly at the undergraduate level, without being well-versed in big data. We do need to prepare this next generation of public leaders, not only in uh, the ways and forms of government and <laughs> politics and so forth, but we need these institutions to be much better and well-versed in their curriculum in the implementation of this kind of coursework to prepare that next generation. Excellent. Uh, Jane, your moonshot idea. Here's my moonshot. I want government in the U.S. to radically improve the degree to which we share data. Right now we have a lot of, you know, there's a term called data mining that is in the big data world. And I have a different definition of it, which is people don't want to share their data. So it's, no, it's mine, right? Mm. So it's data mining. <laughs> and I want to change that. And I think that we have started to see data sharing where one department can share with another within the same government, but we don't have nearly enough of sharing data from the city to the county, to the state, to the federal government and or with outsiders, you know, Uber and Lyft or. So I want us to get to a place where government asks only once for data. And then if we already have the data, we don't ask you to give it to us again. We make good use of what we already have by sharing, right? What did we learn in kindergarten? To share. Absolutely. So big data, utilization of data, and then uh, sharing data responsibly or changing the definition of uh, data mining. Peter Peterson, Jane Wiseman, thank you so much for your time. The entire team here at GX, thanks you for your uh, time and contribution to this podcast. We wish you all the best and we'll definitely look forward to speaking with you in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ian thanks. and Pete.